Hey folks, welcome back to Reaper Minis TV. We're going to start off this episode with several Warlord blisters, and the first one is the Owl Bear that we looked at the green of uh, several episodes ago, but it is out now. This is a two-piece miniature for the Timberthel, or the Wood Elf faction for Warlord. The bulk of the miniature is the body, the head, the two legs, and the left, I guess, arm or claw, you could say, that are all cast as one piece, and then you've got the, the right wing, claw, arm, whatever, as a separate piece. And all of the details, very crisp and clean, very well sculpted model here. There were a few mold lines, you can notice one on the beak itself, but not a whole lot else, a little bit of cleaning here and there, but for a miniature this size, relatively small amount of cleaning necessary. The assembly here is very easy. The right wing just fits right into place into a void on the body, and no real putty needed. Super glued in there, I think it'll be fine. Seems to be pretty stable. The integrated base will fit perfectly on top of a 40 millimeter square base, and that will add some stability to the figure because it is a little bit left heavy, just the way that it's designed in the sort of leaping, jumping pose of the owlbear itself. Outside of Warlord or the Timberthill faction for Warlord, I think any D&D DM would love to have this figure. It makes a great owlbear because that's what it is. Uh, so a superb figure here. I like it a whole lot. Next up is a figure for the Bloodstone Gnomes. This is a Blood Glutton, and being a gnome, he's about dwarf size, maybe a little bit smaller. Two-piece miniature here where you have the helmet as a separate part that gets glued on right at the neck. It's a very easy assembly there. It goes on cleanly. And as a Bloodstone Gnome, he's covered in all sorts of spiky bits, and then on his plates of armor there's little glyphs and little runes carved into it. So he fits in perfectly with the rest of the Bloodstone Gnomes. There was hardly any cleanup necessary on the figure, and like I said, it went together very quickly and easily. Uh, if you aren't playing the Bloodstone Gnomes, I think you could use this as some kind of evil dwarf, maybe as a substitute chaos dwarf in a Warhammer Fantasy Battle Army. A whole bunch of the Bloodstone Gnomes might be good for an uh, alternate chaos dwarf army. Here we have a figure for the Kaboralus army. This is a Frostfang Hunter. It's a single piece miniature that also goes on a 40 millimeter base like the Owlbear. This is a male of the Kaboralus species, and you can see on his wrists he's got weapons that look like these giant teeth or tusks that are strapped onto his hands, almost like huge giant punch daggers. So, kind of a unique weapon there. There was a bit of cleaning to do with the figure because the mold line was visible under each arm and since he's covered in fur you're going to have to be careful when you remove the mold line. Also the casting tab that fits down in the slot of base was curved or bent so had to flatten that back out. Just be careful if yours comes that way so you don't bend the legs into an awkward position. But overall it's a good sculpt. The fur is all consistent and it's a good addition to the Kaboralus line. And then last up for Warlord for this episode is Gorak the Ravager. This is a two-piece miniature for the Isingstead faction. Gorak is a human barbarian type miniature who comes with a very large two-handed axe. Now this comes as a separate piece, but it does fit right into place at the wrists. Really no pinning necessary there, but you could if you wanted the extra stability and were worried about it breaking, but I think it'll be fine. He is a little bit tall for your average human, but I think having him stand apart as a hero or as a unit leader or something like that, I think he'd be fine. In Warlord, he's depicted as a sergeant, so having him stand out maybe as a little larger or more larger than life than some of the other people in the unit would be perfectly fine for this figure. Now for me, I'm not running an Isingstead army, but I have a great use for the figure. I'm building up an all-metal Warriors of Chaos army for Warhammer Fantasy Battle, and about 95% of of it is going to be made of Reaper figures, so this guy is going to make an outstanding Chaos Marauder that's going to go with a bunch of their other barbarian or human figures that may not have a lot of armor but look ferocious and have big weapons. So for me, perfect miniature. Okay, onto the Chronoscope line now, and first up is Professor Kraken, or Kraken if you prefer. This is a single piece miniature of a guy who's dressed in a suit and he also has an overcoat on and he's sort of in a running forward pose and the main difference between him and I guess any other kind of professor would be that he's got a big giant squid head. Obviously his appearance means that you need to have a pretty specific use for the figure but I think in a sci-fi game, in a superhero game, even in a horror game uh, I think you could get a lot of mileage out of the figure, or if you play a couple of different genres, you could use him in a couple of different ways. But as a super villain, I think the name Professor Kraken has a pretty good ring to it, so I think that's probably where he'll end up for me. 
Here we have a superheroine who is named the Incredible Woman. She is very noticeably taller than an average human, so either she has some kind of growth power or is just a very tall lady. But either way, it's a very good superheroine model. Very proportional, quite fit, and she is wearing a skin-tight bodysuit like you might find on a lot of superheroes. The figure needed very little cleaning. Just about the only mold line I could find was a very faint one on the inside and outside of her legs, but that cleaned up very easily and it's on a fairly smooth part there, so really no chance to damage the model as long as you're careful. She's in what I'd call to be sort of an at-the-ready pose where you can see both of her fists are balled up and she's ready to smash somebody if she needs to, but not really an action-oriented kind of pose. Her boots, wristbands, and there's even a collar at the top end of her costume are all sculpted with a bit of separation from the rest of the costume or the rest of her bodysuit. So if you wanted to paint these in different colors, the sculptor has gone ahead and already helped you or given you a hand in doing that just because they are sculpted with a bit of separation there. So that will make painting her a little bit easier. And I think she's a great addition to the superheroes in the Chronoscope line. Can't wait to see more. Okay, onto the Pathfinder line now, and here we have a Whispering Tyrant. This is a three-piece miniature where you get the main body of the figure itself, you get a cape, and actually it's four-piece because you get two horns that go on either side of the head. Now, the main figure itself is fairly tall, maybe about 50% taller than an average human figure, and you can tell it's a skeletal or some kind of spectral creation that's wearing a combination of plate armor and some tattered robes. And on the back, there's a piece of the cape that fits right into the back, and both parts of the miniature that come together are notched, so there's really a guide to help you make sure it gets in the right place. And then the horns just get cut off of the sprue that they come on and fit on either side of the head, so the whole thing is pretty easy to assemble. In Pathfinder, the Whispering Tyrant is a lich. In d and I think that'd be a great use for this model also. You could use it as some kind of ghost or other apparition. For me, I'm going to be using it in a Vampire Count's army as a spirit host. Now, normally with a spirit host, you have three models on a 40mm base, but I think this one is large enough and impressive enough to where I'll drop him onto a 40mm base by himself and just use it as an additional spirit host for my army. Also from the Pathfinder line, we have a Plague Doctor here. This is a single-piece miniature, and immediately I thought that he would not look out of place at all in a game of Mordheim or even Cadwallon. So if you're playing either one of those games, I think he would be a, just easy to drop in there and he would fit the setting and the look of those games without a problem. He's wearing a long trench coat and a wide-brimmed hat. He has a mask on that has a long nose and also some little eye holes to it. He's holding up a potion in his left hand, and his right hand is just kind of down at his side. In his pockets over on the left-hand side, there's a little pair of scissors that you can see and a couple other little instruments that are poking out of there. So definitely some kind of doctor, plague doctor, as he's named. But I think you might even be able to get away using him as a barber surgeon or a similar type character in Warhammer Fantasy roleplay. Okay, and to round out this episode's reviews, we've got two different releases of mouselings. First up are a Bard, Thief, and Knight mouseling. Each of these are single-piece miniatures, and like the other mouselings, they're relatively small, about halfling or small dwarf or maybe gnome-sized miniatures. And each one of these is really well detailed. You've got the Bard who's singing and strumming his lute. You have the Thief. He's carrying a dagger and also has a mask on. And then we have the knight who's got a sword in one hand. He's got plate armor on and a shield which has an acorn on the front of it, which is pretty typical and appropriate iconography for the figures in this line. And then to finish us off, we have a Valentine's Day mouseling. This little guy is sort of running across some clouds, and there's an extra bit of metal from his right foot that goes down to the clouds that you'll need to clip away. And just be careful when you do, because the cloud part where it connects to is sort of a rounded portion of the cloud, and it's quite visible, and also the back end of his foot is. So just be careful and make sure that you clean that up nicely, because it will be visible when you get it painted. Now, as a Valentine's Day mouseling, he does have little wings on the back, so he's definitely fitting the Cupid motif there. And while he might not fit in with the adventuring mouselings, it does carry on the sort of line of holiday-themed mouselings that Reaper's also doing. Okay, everybody, thanks for watching this episode of Reaper Minis TV. We'll see you next time.